My name's Jen Skinner. I'm a retired cardiologist um, and currently work with Health Innovation in Northeastern North Cumbria uh, on the Cardiovascular Disease Programme. This is a webinar about the li local lipid guidelines uh, and the update on that. Uh, and we've got three excellent speakers. I'd also at this point just like to thank the organisation from those members in the Health Innovation because these webinars wouldn't otherwise happen. They're part of a series that we do, so, so look out for others as well. Now, um, firstly, I'd like to welcome Barry Todd, who is a primary care senior clinical pharmacist and Walls End PCN pharmacy lead and has uh, developed substantially the lipid programme uh, where he works. And he's going to talk to us about what does the COF say about lipids and why that's the case. Over to you, Barry. Lovely. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so we're going to deal with the why, first of all, and then what we can do to improve our, our QOF uh, scorings. So why is it important? Now, those of you who've been around the block a few times will remember that uh, cholesterol used to be on QOF uh, for a number of years, and then it was dropped about 10 years ago, believe it or not. So why have they returned? Well, the NHS uh, have set a target of reducing the amount of deaths from cardiovascular disease and stroke over a 10 year period by about 150,000. And part of that is uh, adopting a more aggressive approach to uh, lowering lipid levels by lipid optimization strategies. So uh, I always find the uh, statistics quite appalling. Second highest cause of death in England and Wales in 2022 was uh, through ischemic heart disease, 10.3% of all deaths. And that was a 4.2% increase from 2021. The fourth highest stroke, 5.1% of all deaths uh, during 2022, an increase of 0 0.8% percent. Now remember that most of the, these deaths are preventable and that involves engagement with the patient. They need to do their bit but we certainly need to do our bit too. CVD causes one death every three minutes in the UK and, and those in the most deprived areas and I'm sitting in Wall's End uh, which is regarded as a, uh, as a certain level of deprivation, uh, are four times more likely to die prematurely from cardiovascular disease. So you can make a difference by lowering bad cholesterol, that's non-HDL cholesterol or LDL cholesterol, depending on what your lab reports on, by lowering bad cholesterol by one millimole per litre, you can reduce the incidence of a major cardiovascular event by 23%. Next slide, please. So what are the QOF targets? Now let's read these carefully, okay? There's cholesterol one, and uh, perhaps not surprisingly, cholesterol two. And cholesterol one is really about um, those being eligible for a statin because they have a condition, a diagnosed condition, which makes them eligible. So anybody on a vascular disease register, so they've got IHD, they've had an MI, they've had a stroke or TIA, they've got peripheral artil uh, artillery, arter arterial disease, peripheral, peripheral vascular disease, will be included then. But notice also you've got chronic kidney disease as part of that indicator. Now that isn't a secondary prevention uh, condition. It's regarded as primary prevention, but it's of such a high significance, such a, um, a high um, uh, risk factor for cardiovascular disease. We should be treating these patients with an EGFR of less than 60, on uh, two separate occasions, at least three months apart, on the CKD register, they ought to have a statin as well. No need to do um, uh, a Q risk on, on them. They're automatically eligible. 
14 points. The threshold is 70 to 95 percent of patients. 14 points, 207 pounds, I think it is per point. Cholesterol 2 is about those on a secondary prevention register, but who ought to have their non-HDL cholesterol of less than 2.5 or an LDL cholesterol of less than 1.8. Next slide, please. So cholesterol 1, uh, the, the target seems to be quite daunting, 95% to get your full percentage points there. And that's challenging for the reasons that I've stated. OK, what can we do between now and the end of March to improve our performance? We've only got two months left, but we can be doing something. And there's some quick wins here that we can do in the next two months. You need to have a look at your Arden's um, quaff indicators to calculate your shortfall. Can I have the next slide, please? So um, this is an EMIS view, and uh, you'll have a similar view, I'm sure, on system one. And you'll notice there, um, uh, how am I driving on our quaff indicators, cholesterol one, this is village green surgery, and this is how we are doing. 95% threshold uh, target to get 14 points. We're at 85%, which doesn't sound too bad, but we're only getting less than 8.4 points. Now, if you go down to the bottom there, you'll notice that there's a parent population of 646 patients. We are achieving on 549 of them, which is 85%. The remaining 15% is that 97 excluded patients. So bear that 97 in mind as I go on to talk uh, further. So can we go back a slide? Okay, so what can you do okay um i've put here run searches on on cvd not on lipid lowering therapy uh, but in fact what you can do is that 97 excluded patients you can actually get a list off of those 97 patients and then go through uh, uh on a patient by patient basis or if you're nifty you'll be able to tell uh whether they have an exception code or not already allocated to them but essentially, if they have not declined or if there's no exception code, they, they've not declined or uh, they haven't put it's not tolerated, then they ought to be offered a statin. They ought to have been offered a statin already because they've got a long term condition, cardiovascular condition. But your CKD patients may not have been offered a statin and that provides you with some low hanging fruit there. So if neither declined or not tolerated, a range of review to discuss and where appropriate, prescribe a statin or other appropriate lipid lowering therapy. Exception codes are to do with having been offered the alternatives, you then exception code them, either lipid lowering therapy declined, lipid lowering therapy not tolerated, which includes all of the eligible lipid lowering therapies. If you just put statin declined, statin not tolerated, you will that will not be accept, accepted on the on the quaff. So that's very important that you do that. And where uh, you're at a halfway stage where they are maximum tolerated uh, lipid lowering therapy, then please code that, and that will accept you as well if you're not to target. Uh, next slide, please. And then the next slide. So cholesterol 2, 20 to 35 percent of patients should be to target with their bad cholesterol. Don't be deceived. You think, oh, that's easy to reach. We'll reach that automatically. Uh, have a look at your figures and see if you are reaching them. It's shocking. I was very surprised myself. I thought this was a low threshold initially until I had a look at our performance. We've had to do an awful lot of work to get the 35%, believe you me. But there are some quick wins that you can do before the end of the financial year. Again, look at your shortfall, search for all on the vascular register, identifying when the last cholesterol test uh, date was and what the level was. Remember that you have to have a cholesterol within the last financial year after April the 1st, 2023. And if you haven't got one, 
get them in and do one. You can do that now and hopefully get them to target and get your points up for that. Now, if they've been prescribed a new lipid lowering therapy in the last 12 months, but they haven't been recalled for their bloods, get them in, okay, um, uh, for their uh, lipid, uh, lipids and their LFTs. Now then, if their non-HDL cholesterol is 2.5 or more, then you can intensify the lipid lowering therapy in the next two months and get them in just before the end of March. Two months will be enough, hopefully, to get them to target. Go for the low-hanging fruit. Those with their last non-HDL cholesterol between 2.5 and 3 are more likely to get to target by intensifying their lipid lowering therapy regime. Next slide, please. So the new NICE guidelines concerning cardiovascular disease management uh, uh, with lipid optimization uh, has been a cause for confusion. Well, yes and no. First of all, the NEELY guidelines, the local guidelines and the QOF base their targets on clinical evidence, as do the European Society of Cardiology and the American Cardiac Association. So well documented uh, targets there. Uh, but NICE guidelines base their target on a cost effective model. They want more bangs for their books. So they set a slightly higher target, uh, a, a lower target, if you like, a less aggressive target of 2.6, that's less than 2.7, or an LDL of 2, which is less than 2.1. So a bit of variation there. Where we do agree is that the nearly and NICE guidelines both say that lipid intensification is better than using a torvastatin 80 milligram alone. Remember, the lower the cholesterol, the better, and there's no such thing as a cholesterol that's too low. NICE would say, um, a torvastatin 80 milligram plus azetamide should be routinely used uh, rather than just a, a, a torvastatin 80 milligrams alone, and then do the tweaking at the end of that to get to target. Neely would say, a torvastatin 80 milligram, and then depending on what your level is at that stage, would depend on where you go to with your therapy. If you're going to get to target with a zetamibe, that would be with a non-HCL of say 3.1 or less, then use a zetamibe. But if your non-HCL is above 3.2, get them in, do a fasting lipids to see whether they're uh, eligible for inclisiran, which is an injectable lipid lowering therapy. Next slide, please. Some cautionary notes before I hand over to my colleagues. Uh, Quaff targets remain at a non-HDL of less than 2.5, HDL of less than 1.8, unless we hear otherwise. Be familiar with the Neely guidelines. Always use the latest version, which is 2023 version 1. Never, but never file off your lipid profile without looking at the non-HDL or the LDL cholesterol to check whether it's to, the, to target. Don't be taken in by a default comment, normal or normal for patient on the lab report. If your patient has a total cholesterol of 7.5 or more, then consider the possibility at least of familial hypercholesterolemia, again, following the NEELY guidelines, and where targets can't be reached using the uh, lipid lowering therapies available into primary care, eligible lipid lowering therapies, then that may involve a referral into your local lipid clinic where a PCSK9 injection may need to be prescribed. Jane. Thank you, Barry. Uh, that's very clear. Um, we've got a couple of questions coming through the chat and we've got a bit of time. So uh, the first one is somebody asking and somebody else actually asking the same about resources and information leaflets for patients with CKD about statins, because this is a relatively new thing for some CKD patients. So I don't know if you can put some some links into the chat, perhaps to the ones that you use with your patients or if you've got any of those. Right, OK, there are leaflets available, locally produced leaflets produced in the northeast. If you let Jane know or us know 
um, your email address, then we could get those sent out to you. Uh, we would always refer people, of course, to the, um, uh, the well, there's the, <laughs> there's, um, the, uh, the, the patient.co.uk website, but there's also the, okay, let me get this right, there is a UK kidney website as well, which will have uh, something on, on there. Best thing is, let me let us have your email addresses, and we'll I'll, I'll get something out to you. I'll, I'll I think I think Barry, because there may be people who um, may be joining at different times and so on. Um, can we suggest that we put the link into the chat facility so people have got it? Is it available online? Uh, there will be. I'd need to have a look. Yeah. At it can you put Can you put the web link into the chat, yeah. and then if people and otherwise we can send the, the web links by email, but. Um, we can circulate those afterwards, but by all means, put them in the chat now so people have them whilst it, it's the, at the forefront of their mind. Um, the second question was relating to cholesterol uh, 2. Uh, somebody, uh, Philip has asked, I had a few patients where non-HDL is greater than 2.5 on maximum statin and zetamide, so I brought in for fasting lipids and LDL is less than 1.8, so no further action according to Neely but still appearing on quaff as non-HDL seems to be the priority, question mark. Right. So if you've got a, a, a non-HDL, uh, sorry, a non-HDL of less than 2.5 or an LDL of less than 1.8, you are to target. If there's any doubt about it, OK, um, lowering lipids uh, even further is, is totally acceptable. And that can be done by, uh, and, and uh, my colleagues will, will talk about this in a minute, but you can uh, add in um, a, a, to a tomosatin 80 plus a zetamibe. You can change the zetamibe to a zetamibe with benbidoic acid uh, to get to, to, to make sure that you are down below the, uh, the non-HDL of, of 2.5. But if you've got an, uh, uh, an LDL of less than 1.8, you'll get the point. I think, I think, Barry, the question is more to do with um, the LDL is less than 1.8 and therefore meets the guidelines. Um, and therefore, from a clinical care point of view, that there's no need to put extra work into that individual patient and the bother to the patient to come in again. But from a quaff point of view, purely from an administrative point of view, the quaff is still showing that the non-HGL has not reached target. So how do you manage that? You get the, you'll get the point because you've got an LDL of less than 1.8. Right, fine. So you still get the points. Yeah. 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 Uh, I okay. Think, uh, I, th so, I think yeah. I think that that's fine. Um, yeah. Um, there was a question about um, using benbidoic acid with atorvastatin, but I think Stuart and Suanne are going to pick that up that's in their right. presentation. Yes. So um, if that's all right, we'll leave that one until then. Um, OK, I think that's picked up the questions. I don't know. Philip's come back uh, with regards to the non-HDL of above 2.5 after fasting. So if you want to pick that up in, in the chat, Barry, as Stuart and um, Sue Ann do their presentation. Um, Thank you, Barry. That's absolutely super. And it brings together the uh, demands of meeting the quaff, but whilst also giving excellent clinical care. So thank you for that. Um, we'll move on, please. And we're going to talk about the Neely guidelines and the recent updates. And I'm very pleased to welcome Dr. Stuart Patman, who is a consultant chem chemical pathologist and lead for the Lipid Clinic in Northumbria NHS Healthcare Trust. And also Dr. Sue Anti, who is a consultant endocrinologist at the QE Hospital in Gateshead and is also lead for the Gateshead Lipid Service. Um, so I'll hand over to both of them. They're going to do a double act, so I'll leave it up to them to uh, to do that. Thanks, um, Jane. So I'm going to kick off and then hand over to Sue. Um, 
So as you're all um, hopefully aware, the Northeast Evaluation of Lipid Intensification Guidelines have been around for um, a couple of years now, and they are available on the uh, hosted on the NTAG website. And I know they are linked into various other areas such as TeamNet uh, locally as well. So hopefully everyone has, has seen and got access to those. Uh, next slide. Um, so I would I would hesitate to say that um, it's not a it's not a ripping read. It's not something you take to, to bed at night and you pour over. But I know fats. Um, actually, can you just click on? I think there's a probably a couple of images. So um, just keep, keep clicking actually for the for that slide uh, and one once more. So it's not. Um, oh, sorry, back again. It's not a, a, a case of um, take it to bed and have a look at it. It's it's a reference guide, much as yellow pages. Yeah your cheese and onion clinical medicine or your, your BNF uh, and are you go to the section that you are addressing the issue with and you'll find either a flow chart, a table usually in terms of trying to guide you. We've added stuff around frailty as well and de-prescribing um, in the recent update as well because that's uh, that's obviously as, as important to uh, focus appropriate medication and de-prescribing um, when, when it's not going to add to clinical clinical benefit. Next slide please. Um, so yeah, the, the, the sections that we're just going to try and cover off is around the primary secondary prevention. There'll be a little bit of statin intolerance, and then I'll hand over to Sue for some of the severe uh, FH and the hypertriglyceridemia cases. And we're going to do this by illustrating some cases, basically. We thought that was probably the best way of sparking debate and illustrating how we think Neely would help you guide your patient management. And there's other sections on pregnancy, children, familiar have clostridium in children, and other bits around, as I said, frailty, drug interactions lipoprotein LA and lipid clinic referrals in the Neely sections as well. Uh, next slide, please. So here we go. Just to kick off the scenarios, and this is a this is a patient who will just take through um, about three different scenarios just to illustrate the different approaches that, that, that could happen. So this is a 53-year-old male, secondary prevention because he's had a single MI last year. Um, and he's on a 12 statin, 80 milligrams, and, and the, the nice uh, guidelines and nearly would, would recommend uh, starting statins high intensity straight away uh, on diagnosis of that vascular event. I've put in low cholesterol diet. That's a very, it's a very simple three word statement that, but actually uh, if you look at nice, um, the, the nice 3238 guidelines, it talks about a cardioprotective diet um, containing less than 30% of sat, uh, sorry, fat content and less than 7% of that should be saturated fats, focusing to take more of your fats as monounsaturated and polyunsaturates. That's quite a mouthful and that's quite difficult to get over in some of the brief interactions that you may have with your uh, patients. Uh, I would very much commend the heart, the healthy eating guide, which is produced by Heart UK. Again, I think this is on Team Net. There's a link at the bottom of the slides here as well, um, which basically gives a traffic lighted um, selection of different foods, puts them in green, amber and red categories and obviously focusing your patient's diet towards those green and potentially amber, obviously the high days and holidays when people can have birthdays or whatever, but focusing more of that diet towards those green and, and, and amber sections to get that low cholesterol diet, because that is really important. I think we do sometimes forget about that in the, the whole right targets and drugs and stuff, but that is that is very, it shouldn't be lost in the, in, in the emphasis in terms of a patient's well-being going forward. And risk reduction. So the um, this patient's had some um, a non-fasting lipid profile, just as it's uh, I guess an annual medical review. Cholesterol is coming at five point nine. Uh, triglyceride 1.4 there. HDL 1.2. Non-HDL 4.7. Next next click please. Thanks very much. So um, if we look at the green section of Neely, and this is, you've got the patient on a, on a statin, and this is where we go to the green um, section. There's a flow chart that says secondary prevention beyond standard therapy. And by standard therapy, we mean statins, basically. Um, this will then pr promote you to go on to look at deciding whether you need to uh, actually um, do a fasting lipid profile. And this this non-HDL is, is above three. So that's the trigger on the red section um, to, to go ahead and do the fasting um, lipid profile. And that gives you your LDL cholesterol. So NICE have aligned all of the eligibility for the further treatments based on LDL, which is really is really only accurate when you're fasting in the fasting status, hence requiring the fasting blood test and the LDL is um, is reported. Um, so just click on the next um, 
next click thank you so yeah we're following down this this red route on the on the right hand side the nearly guidelines and again this is very small print but is obviously on the ridge on the uh, the guidelines is uh we'll show an ldl of above four um pushing you down into the bottom right square which says refer for pcsk9 monoclonal antibody therapy so this is the uh, fortnightly self injections that we can um is a hospital only prescription so would require a, um, a choose and book referral to, to your local lipid clinic um, and, and the discussion with the patient to say would they be interested in, in a fort, fortnightly self-injection and these are very they've been very um, warmly received I think we use them a lot of time with patients who are statin intolerant as well but this patient would be eligible even when they're on maximum um, statin and obviously hopefully taking their statin on a regular basis of course so th this would be the this would be the kind of route down this red um, axis here um, I'll go on to the next slide because we can just illustrate this case in a slightly different scenario. Just again, the history is the same, just, just to kind of um, align that in terms of secondary prevention on maximal dose statin here, low cholesterol diet. However, in this case, you've come back with your non-fasting lipid profile and it is of a lower uh, value here coming at 4.5. The triglyceride 1.2, your HDL1 and your non-HDL 3.5. So if we can have next click, please. So now you are following again on the on the flow chart down this red, the first red box, because your non-HDL is above three. That will then trigger you to, to say, well, I need to do a fasting profile and see this patient's LDL and, and their triglycerides in a fasting state. And the LDL comes out at 2.9, which would now shift you down the yellow boxes here. Um, and this will align to the um, nice guidance around use of inclizaran. Um, when the LDL is sitting um, above um, uh, 2.6 and, um, um, and above. And, and really, this is an interesting scenario. So NICE don't, um, they say anyone is eligible for a value above this. We think that Inclizaran has a um, a use case really focused in, in these patients who uh, perhaps don't have the very high LDLs where they could be eligible for the fortnightly PCSK9 uh, injections, which do have more outcome evidence at the moment. And that's why we think that's a sensible option for those sorts of patients. But for the for these patients who are slightly below that um, that cut off, then uh, then this would be our recommendation that they should be offered in clizaran. So this is a um, a subcutaneous injection. They are given two injections, three monthly apart initially, and thereafter on a six monthly rolling basis, and that can be given in addition to the statin as well. And it's a green drug, so it can be prescribed in primary care. And the next, so the next scenario I'm just going to move on to with this patient is a slightly different one and one that was touched on before. So this is a patient, so same scenario in terms of secondary prevention, but in this, this time they're on a lower dose of statin because they can't tolerate 80 milligrams of um, atorvastatin. They're on a fairly low dose, 10 milligrams of atorvastatin. And we've also added in zetamide because they couldn't tolerate that, that um, they'd been on zetamide for a while and they couldn't tolerate the, the higher dose of the statin. The cholesterol here we've done as a, a non-fasting profile. So again, we're getting a non-HDL of, of, um, of 2, 2.7. Um, and then this actually pushes us down to not requiring a fasting sample. If we follow the flow chart down, it actually tells us to optimize lipid lowering therapy. And this is where we think about some oral medications. Now, I want to just take a sideline here just to talk a little bit about benpidoic acid. So can I just have the next slide? please so this is a this is an area that, that i think has come up for discussion before and i just wanted to set out the framework that we can that we think that benpidoic acid can be used according to different scenarios so most patients will add in benpidoic acid to azetamide monotherapy that's going to be a standard bread and butter for people who can't take statins they're fine on azetamide. They don't quite meet that the um, requirements for injectables, but you just want to add something else in. So benpidoic acid is your go-to medication. So if you look at the summary of the, the product characteristics, um, how is it framed, the use of benpidoic acid? 
Well, they actually frame that you can use it with a statin or a statin with other lipid lowering therapies in patients and able to reach the LDL goals with maximum tolerated dose of statin. But there's a contraindication to using with simvastatin above 40 milligrams daily. We don't really use high dose of simvastatin anyway, so that's a slightly mute point. The BNF would say that um, it actually can be used in combination with a, uh, with a statin or with a statin and other lipid lowering therapies. So it is licensed for use of that. However, NICE TA694, um, the wording is interesting because they um, they state that it's used as an option um, as, as an adjunct to diet, but recommended if statins are contraindicated or not tolerated. Now, the big thing here is the definition of not tolerated. So you cannot tolerate a torvastatin 80 milligrams, but you can tolerate a torvastatin 10 milligrams. However, that is suboptimal in achieving your target. Now, the, the, this this is slightly this is where the definitions of toleration uh, are, are, are kind of go into sort of the, the the finer detail. And some of the studies, if we look about the definitions of that, they were only able the definition of tolerance was based on low dose statin. So patients who were defined as unable to tolerate a statin were on very low doses of statin, so less than ten milligrams of twelve statin less than five milligrams of a superstatin. So they were taking a statin, but they weren't tolerating a high dose of a statin. So it may, I think the definitions of tolerance may not reflect clinical practice, I think it's fair to say in some of the studies. Next slide. So what do we think is a practical way forward, a practical way that we would recommend? So I think you're always looking at the high cardiovascular risk patients. So these are secondary prevention patients or they've got a genetic li lipid diagnosis such as familial hypercholesterolemia. I think they, they should be ineligible for injectable lipid lowering therapy, which is always our first go to medication. But I think these patients um, who we would use benpedoic acid along with a statin and azetamibe should be on a low dose statin. So 10 milligrams of torvastatin, 5 milligrams of, of resuvastatin, and they should be tolerating the um, azetamibe as well. And then in those patients, I think you can add in benpedoic acid, 180 milligrams. I wouldn't add in um, benpedoic acid if they're on a high dose statin, uh, certainly above that 10 of a torvastatin and a 5 of resuvastatin, and um, because that that is um, not defined in terms of the research, and it's not what was done. Um, and again, the, there has been instances of certainly in higher doses of, of um, uh, side effects at that at that dose. So I think in summary, benpedoic acid you can use with a statin if it's a secondary. Uh, prevention, higher risk patient, and you're using a, a low dose statin as defined in, in those slides. Next uh, slide, please. So the, fi the final scenario is just, uh, so this is how we're going to treat this patient. We're going to add in benpedoic acid alongside the statin and azetamide there just to, just to summarize that, that case, which I think would be appropriate for that patient. Um, thank you. Um, and I'm going to hand over to Sue there um, just to cover off the um, a couple of other scenarios. Thanks. Right. Thanks, Stuart. So we're moving on very quickly to severe hypercholesterolemia. So this is probably the top uh, reason for referral to lipid clinic. I'm just going to cover briefly how you'd approach um, such a possible scenario. So we've got um, a lady, Mrs. B49. She comes for a health check and you find her non-fasting lipid profile to show cholesterol of 8.4 triglyceride 1.2, non-HDL 6.6. So um, where do we go next? So Neely would suggest you go to the orange or peach section, whichever you wish to, to, to call it. Um, and the next step would be to do a fasting lipid profile. So as Stuart said, the LDL is only accurate uh, because it's calculated uh, when the patient is fasting. So um, this is one of the top reasons why your referral might get pushed back from lipid clinic if there's no fasting lipids um, recorded. Uh, so you do a fasting lipid profile, and that's to see whether um, fasting, the patient still has total cholesterol of more than 7.5 or an LDL of more than 4.9. Um, and then Neely will tell you to look for um, secondary causes, because again, high cholesterol could be due to variety of secondary causes. So just to highlight a few of the common ones, so certain uh, diets. So nowadays there's um, things like ketogenic diet that will push your lipid profile um, up adversely. Uh, things like alcohol, uncontrolled diabetes, thyroid function, uh, liver and nephotic syndrome, for example. Um, and the next thing to bear in mind is that um, it's very useful to compare to previous lipid uh, profile, especially in a lady of uh, this sort of age range. Um, menopause will push your um, lipid profile um, adversely as well with the loss of estrogen. So if you look back and actually 20 years ago, um, lipids are completely normal and it's just with approaching this age that it's gone up. 
then uh, you might um, kind of be less inclined to think that this is a genetic disorder. And the third thing uh, to kind of highlight here is that family history has to be specified. So um, in Neely, we mentioned the Simon Broom criteria, which is uh, on the next page following this flow chart. Um, and Simon Broom says that uh, you need to have a family history of uh, myocardial infarction or ischemic heart disease less than 60 years in a first degree relative or less than 50 years in second degree relative. Um, people rarely know what their relative's cholesterol levels are, but occasionally you do get all patients coming to say that, oh, actually, my mom's cholesterol is 14. Those that really stick out, um, then you might be able to get a history. Um, other options, if you're not sure the patient meets Simon Broom criteria, are to ask their first degree relatives to have a cholesterol check to see if their total cholesterol might meet the criteria for that. Um, and then if your fasting lipid profile and family history meets Simon Broom criteria, um, then um, the suggestion from Neely is uh, to write a referral to your local lipid clinic. Um, if it doesn't meet the criteria for possible FH, then um, it advises you to risk assess the patient as to whether they should be offered statin therapy or not. Uh, could I have the next slide, please? Uh, next, please. Um, so swiftly moving on to high triglycerides. Um, so we have this uh, scenario of Mr. C, 53-year-old, um, who goes for another routine blood test. Um, and he's found to have cholesterol level of 9.2, triglyceride 18.2, um, CHBA1C is normal, um, thyroid function is normal. Um, next, please. So um, the flowchart for um, hypertriglyceridemia is found in the yellow section of Neely. Um, so it's quite sort of easy to follow boxes. Um, and basically the main points are, again, to look for secondary causes. Um, of all the kind of high triglyceride referrals that I get, most often there is a secondary cause that is easily identified. Um, and the key would be to treat the underlying cause. So the top two would be uncontrolled diabetes uh, or alcohol intake. Um, and once those causes are addressed, actually, you find that after three or four months, you repeat the lipid profile and it's um, it usually uh, is, you know, much better. Uh, so that would be the first thing to do. The second thing that Neely asks to do is to repeat a fasting lipid profile and APOB uh, within five to 14 days um, if the tricks are more than 4.5. So that's in the um, sort of pale blue box um, at the beginning. Um, and if you find that on repeat, the, tr uh, the tricks are still more than 10, the advice is to start phenofibrate um, to try and lower this uh, to try to mitigate the risk of pancreatitis um, and to refer to lipid clinic if you can't find any secondary causes and um, they still have high triglycerides. Uh, next click, please. So on the bottom, uh, could I have the next? Uh, yeah, on the bottom of that flow chart, you'll see a, a very handy guide or list of secondary causes. Uh, so like I said, obesity metabolic syndrome, very prevalent nowadays, um, diet with high fat. So these kind of ketogenic diets, they, they kind of promote very high fat um, in the diet, um, excess alcohol consumption, type 2 diabetes, and a whole long list of medications, which I'll uh, leave you to, to read there. Um, so that was a, a kind of whistle-stop tour, really, of um, key sections of Neely we thought would be most relevant and useful in primary care. Um, and uh, I think we should probably open the floor to questions now um, from the audience. Thanks very much. Thank you very much indeed from both of you. Um, are there are any questions in the chat at the moment. A couple of uh, comments though. Philip Stubbs, I think with regards to the combination of benzodiazepine acid and statins, that has now been covered. So thank you for doing that. And can I just clarify, is there a life protein B, we, we, can primary care request that? Yeah, it's available in all areas. Yeah, so yeah, that, yeah. so right. we normally get the advice and guidance, you know, complete with the FOB level and what should we do, that kind of thing. So it is. Uh... Yeah. Any other questions? Yes, hi, I've got one. Uh, um, Catherine Hall, GP, North Tyneside. Um, thank you. Uh, I'm often uh, puzzled and have to work this through. But I'm just wondering with patients with those medications, I'm thinking particularly mental health patients, do you, and, and it, um, it's really difficult to take them off, for example, a lanspine. Uh, what do you do then? Do you just go through your, your treatment regime, accepting we can't change that medication, we just have to treat their triglycerides? Thank you. 
Yeah, thanks for that. So I think I agree. Um, it's not practical to kind of stop those medications. So I think what I would do is to look at other factors, if there are any, for example, things that can be modified. So diet, uh, you know, metabolic syndrome, diabetes, things like that, alcohol. Um, and if we kind of have ticked all the boxes to say, yes, there's nothing else that we can change, um, then we might just have to accept that that's a side effect of medication. And then if the tricks are above 10, then we could add phenofibrid to try and, um, you know, reduce that risk slightly. But um, yeah, I agree that the, the mental health things are the last thing to kind of, it's like diagnosis of exclusion type of a thing. I don't know if you've got anything else, Stuart. To... Um no, it's very really hard. I think you've got to recognise these patients have got a high cardiovascular risk um, anyway, and and perhaps some of the lifestyle choices again may be better where we add into their risk as well. So I, I do find these difficult actually. Um, I think this this um, you know there are times I have contacted the. Uh, specialist or, or under whose care there are to say are there anything else that, that they could try if i was particularly worried so i guess um sometimes you're worried if they have had pancreatitis before then you know that that's sort of thing if they've been stable for a long time and they've been okay then you're probably you're looking at more the cardiovascular risk and getting it down if if it's due to high triglycerides and had pancreatitis then i really would be pushing that envelope more to say look we need to look at something coming down because their physical you know acute physical health um could, could suffer but yes it's 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 a tight rope it's do no harm isn't it really it's it's, it's difficult thank you um i can't see any other questions um and uh, i can't see any hands up at the moment so um i'll bring this session to a close christine can we come up to the next slide um and thank you our speakers very much indeed for the uh, presentations today and um, the link will be circulated in due course um, and just a reminder we've got a chronic kidney disease webinar coming up on the 7th of March which is 12 to 1 which is going to cover those aspects and um, so um, invitations for that will be coming around with the links uh, so thank you to you all thank you for all the participation and I'll bring the session to a close now thank you all